It was six o'clock on Monday morning. I was backing out of our garage to get to my job in Manhattan at 645. We lived in a small suburban community called Nassau Shores on the south shore of Long Island, not far from New York City. I stopped in the driveway to make sure the garage door was closed before I pulled away from the house. The only time I forgot to check was two weeks ago. An angry Lauren called me at work, accusing me of not caring about her. Anyone could have come in and attacked her while I was gone. Of course, I knew she was right and explained that I had simply forgotten and would try not to forget again. This calmed her down a little, but she still kept going on about how careless I was. Did I really not care about her at all? How stupid could I be? I tried to reassure her by reminding her that I hadn't done this in the three years we'd lived in this house, and I would definitely make sure I didn't do it again. For the last two weeks, she still seems to blame me for this mystic. Things were definitely cool in our house, and for the life of me, I couldn't understand why she still had these feelings for me. My name is Jeff Carlson, and my wife is Lauren. I am 27 years old. My height is 170 centimeters. I have light brown hair that I wear long, but not long enough to pull into a ponytail and a close-cropped beard. I head the foreign exchange department in one of the largest commercial banks in the country. Essentially, we take advantage of constantly changing exchange rates around the world. The basic idea is to buy a currency at a low price, and when its value rises, sell it and make a profit. This activity is not for the faint of heart. Essentially, we are gambling with the bank's money. This requires very developed intuition and good timing. Buying too early or too late, selling too early or too late, can cost the bank hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions. The reason I have received two promotions in the last two years is because I have very good intuition. Somehow I can see when to buy and when to sell. I don't understand how my mind does this. Just by looking at trends, I feel like it's the right thing to buy or sell, and my guesses have been correct most of the time. The few times I was wrong in my assumptions didn't matter when the bank executives figured out how many millions of dollars I had actually made for them over the last four years. Lauren is also 27, although she is a few months older than me. She is 165 centimeters tall, with jet black hair styled just below her shoulders. She has a round face with soft Italian features. With her olive Mediterranean skin, she is visually stunning. At least that's what I think. Perhaps I'm biased. She has small breasts with a thin waist, a beautiful ass, not too big, not too small. She works in Huntington, New York, a town located on the north shore of Long Island, about 25 minutes from our home. She works for a national health insurance company. They are part of the FEHBP. They provide health insurance to federal and state employees. She does most of her work in the Huntington office, but sometimes they attend many insurer meetings and speak directly with employees to try to convince them to sign up during open season. She has been working there for two years now. Her immediate supervisor is Jim Beckman. She's been working for him since she was hired. I've met him once or twice at company events over the past two years. One was a Christmas party and the other was a company picnic. He was larger than me, 190 centimeters tall and weighing just over 90 kilograms. It is clear that he trains regularly. He never did anything like that, but I just didn't like him. Something about him bothered me. It was my intuition speaking again. There was something out of place there and it bothered me, but not enough to make me mention it to Lauren. As I watched the garage door close, I tuned my satellite radio to a country western music station. The songs were a little darker, which was just right to suit my mood. They sang about real things, failed marriages, unrequited love, and cheating spouses. As I was driving down the street, the first song was about some guy who loved his bar. Catchy melody, but I didn't understand it. I ran a red light and stopped the car when the second song started playing. As I sat by the light source, it felt like my eyes were opening for the first time in a long time. The singer sang about the same thing that was happening in my marriage to Lauren. I didn't realize it, but I was sitting at a traffic light with my mouth open listening to a song when the cars behind me started honking their horns. I looked up, saw the green light, and started moving forward. I crossed the street into a shopping center parking lot. I sat and listened to the rest of the song and then went to the train station. 
I must have been on autopilot because I don't remember driving there. I caught an earlier 6.30 train to Penn Station. As I sat on the train, I remembered the first time I met Lauren. It was in July, just after my 16th birthday. I would be a junior in high school when school returned. I was mowing the lawn in front of my dad's house when a cargo van pulled into the Miller's driveway two doors down. Old Miller died last year. Mrs. Miller was a sweet but fragile woman. One of her children lived two towns away from her and wanted her to live with them. Consequently, the house was put up for sale. I watched as the new BMW followed closely behind the moving van. I didn't know their names at the time, but Mr. Frank Schiavo exited through the driver's door and his wife Cheryl exited through the passenger's door. Appearing behind her from the back seat was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. Lauren Schiavo was a few months older than me. Her hair was cut short, giving her an elfin appearance. She was wearing tight denim shorts and a tank top. She looked at me and gave me a smile. For me, it was love at first sight. A few days later, after the move was completed, I happened to be walking down the street and saw Lauren sitting outside with her mom. I don't know where I got the courage to go up and introduce myself to them. Cheryl Schiavo was a beautiful woman in her own right. Lauren was a miniature version of her mother. Mrs. Schiavo was smart enough to realize that I didn't really want to talk to her and went into the house to get us some iced tea. After giving us tea, she returned to the house, leaving us sitting on the porch and talking. I'm sure she eavesdropped on our conversation as we sat on the porch. We got along great, and I spent every day with Lauren for the rest of that summer. I told her about the school we would both be going to in the fall. I was just happy to be in her company. July gave way to August, and then school began. We weren't in the same class or took the same classes, but we ate lunch together and rode the same bus home every day. After only being at the school for a week, I learned that the school held a harvest dance in mid-October. The next day was Saturday, and I saw Mrs. Schiavo and Lauren coming home from grocery shopping. I went down to their house to help bring in groceries. After the last bag arrived, I asked Lauren if she would go to the dance with me. She looked at her mom and said yes. Her mother smiled. I later found out that she really liked me and thought I would be good for her daughter. As September slipped into October, I began to see Lauren less often than before. She made new friends among the cheerleaders. I knew she wanted to be a cheerleader from conversations we had over the summer, and she was doing it to get a spot on the team. I actually saw her every day on the bus, and we always sat together and talked. The big day has finally arrived. I was going to show off my girlfriend to all the boys at school. I'm sure none of them thought a girl like Lauren would be with a nerd like me. My father drove us to school since I was too young to get my license. As we started dancing, I saw a few guys from the football team look at us, and some of them grinned and laughed among themselves. I wondered what it all meant, but decided to forget about it and went to sit with my friends and have some fun. We danced a few times and sat on the sidelines for a while when a slow song started playing. Before I could ask Lauren to dance, Billy Barber, the star linebacker, was there and extended his hand to Lauren and said, Come on, baby. It's time for everyone to know who you're really with. Lauren jumped up from her seat and left without looking back. I sat with my mouth open. I looked back at my friends and asked, What just happened? My friend Jack said, It looks like you just got dumped. I looked at Lauren and Billy. It became obvious that this was not the first time they had danced together. I felt the color rush to my face. I was so ashamed. I was made to look like a fool. When the dance ended, Billy and Lauren walked over to the football team's tables. Billy Barber was one of the biggest guys in school. I knew I couldn't beat him in a physical confrontation. I couldn't do anything but sit in my seat. I looked at the football team, and they were all looking at me and laughing. At least Lauren didn't turn around and join them in mocking me. I sat at the table most of the night. I wanted to run out of there, but I wouldn't give them such pleasure. I was truly treated to Billy, walking up to me, putting his hand on my shoulder and whispering in my ear, You didn't think a weakling like you could date a girl like Lauren, did you? He looked at me and laughed mockingly, then walked away, shaking his head. Lauren never returned to the table or spoke to me until the end of the dance. I saw that she was having a great time with her new friends. 
I wondered if she was laughing at me too. Finally, the dancing came to an end. I thought with horror about what I had to do next. I walked over to where Lauren was sitting with Billy and his friends. Lauren, my dad will be here soon, and I need to take you home. Billy replied, Get lost, Carlson. She's coming home with me. Lauren? I snapped. I really don't care how you get home. If you don't come home with me, my dad will be forced to tell your mom that you left with someone else. You can explain to your mom why you came home with Billy. I turned and walked away. At that moment, I didn't care if she went home alone. Soon, Lauren sat down in the seat next to me. She tried to make small talk by asking, Did you have a good time at the dance, Jeff? I looked at her with disgust and replied, Are you from another planet? You left me for that idiot Billy Barber. Obviously, this was planned in advance. You didn't say another word to me until the end of the dance and you're asking me about it? So, to answer your question? No, I had a bad time tonight. Soon I saw my father's car stop in front of the school. I stood up and headed towards his car. My sudden movement surprised Lauren and she almost had to run to catch up with me. The windows of Dad's car were open, as it was a cool and pleasant autumn night. When we approached, he asked us, Guys, did you like the dancing? I didn't answer, and a funny expression appeared on his face. I think he felt something was wrong. As we approached the car together, she waited by the rear passenger door while I opened it and sat behind her. I had other planes. I opened the front passenger door, got in, and closed it, letting Lauren climb in herself. My father was furious. He told me to go out and open the door for my companion. I told him I would do it if she were my girlfriend. I looked at my father, and his look said, What the hell's going on? While I sat in deathly silence, Lauren opened the back door of the car and got inside. My dad shrugged and drove us home. Not a word was spoken. When we arrived at the house Shiavos, Lauren's mom was waiting at the door. My dad got out of the car and so did Lauren, but I just sat there. Lauren's mom also felt something was wrong. She knew that I usually walked Lauren to the door. As Lauren walked past her mom, I turned to look at her. I saw her mom look at my dad questioningly. Then she looked at me. Lauren turned to look behind her and we made eye contact. We tried to read each other's expressions. I couldn't read anything from Lauren's face at all. It was a blank page. If she could read my expression, it must have been filled with disgust and anger. When Dad got back into the car, he asked me what happened. I just told him that at the dance, she found someone she liked better than me. I never told him about her deception. He told me, forget about her, son. The sea is full of fish. After that, we hardly spoke. Sometimes I passed by her house. She might wave or say, Hi, Jeff. I always ignored her. I walked by one day while Mrs. Schiavo was out with Lauren, and they both greeted me at the same time. I said meaningfully, Hello, Mrs. Schiavo. Nice day, isn't it? I didn't say a word to Lauren. It was as if she no longer assisted for me. Soon Lauren stopped trying to talk to me. I saw Billy Barber pick her up in his car every morning with a bunch of other kids and drop her off after school. She made the support team. I got on the honor roll. After high school, she went to work, and I went to Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania on a full scholarship. My parents threw me a big graduation party. The Schiavos were invited because they had become close friends of my parents. Lauren was not invited. My parents wanted it but I told them that if she was invited, I wouldn't come to my own party. It came as a surprise when Mrs. Schiavo sat down next to me. She told me, I was so surprised when you came home on the night of that dance. I thought you two would make a great couple. I'm truly sorry that something happened between you two that night. We chatted a little about Wharton, and then she finally blurted out, What happened between you two that night? I looked straight into her eyes. It was like looking into the face of Lauren as she would become 20 years later. Older but still young, just like Lauren would be. I had never thought of her that way before and quickly put it out of my mind. Finally, I told her, We realized that we want certain things from life. That night we discovered that they were two different things. I really wasn't ready to talk more about Lauren's deception. 
She looked like she wanted to say something else, but thought better of it. She kissed me on the cheek, wished me luck, and left. My new job at the bank started in mid-June. This gave me a month to find an apartment in New York, something close to work, and I eventually settled on a one-bedroom bathroom apartment in the Soho area near Hudson Square. It was a great location where everything was within walking distance. There was no need for a car. My new job was stressful, and I was learning the ins and outs of my new position. It took up all my time. We didn't have time to communicate. I quickly realized that what we were taught in school and what is needed in real-life situations are a completely different reality. It's been four months since I last saw Mom and Dad. One evening, my mother called and invited me home for the weekend. She told me that I could stay in my old room. This wouldn't be a problem since half of my clothes were there anyway. Besides, I missed my mother's home-cooked food. The easiest way to get to my parents' house was by train. They lived just eight blocks north of the train station. Four blocks after I had walked, a car pulled up next to me, signaled. A school friend named Becca leaned out of the window and shouted, Hey, stranger, do you need a ride? Hell yes, I shouted. It's hotter here than hell. Jumping into the back seat, I saw my old friend Jack behind the wheel. We sat parked on the side of the road and reminisced about what had happened in our lives over the past four years. It was fun to be in the company of old friends. I didn't know you guys were a couple. How long does this last? I asked. Becca held out her left hand to show me her wedding ring. Are you married? I asked in surprise. For two years now, Jack answered with a smile. I had no idea, I answered somewhat sadly. I haven't been a good friend for the last four years, have I? This is crazy, Becca replied. We didn't contact you either. It's just life. Thank you for that, Becca, was my relieved response. I'm really glad to see you guys again. At those words, I saw an idea pop into Jack's mind. It was an idea that should have been thought about more seriously, but he just blurted it out. What he said next changed my life. Listen, Jeff, we're having a party at our house tomorrow night. Would you like to come? Sitting in the back seat, I saw Becca turn to Jack and look at him. It was a look that men begin to understand as soon as they get married. This meant, are you crazy? Shut up. If I had understood this look, I would have declined the invitation. Since I'm just a guy and don't know the meaning of this look, I think I made the wrong decision. Of course, that's great. I wish I could. Will any of our old school friends be there? Becca turned, gave me a meaningful look, and said, Yes, there must be quite a few of them. Great. I can't wait. I'll bring some beer. What time and where do you guys live now? Jack said, 7.30. We live at 135 Ransom Street, not too far from your parents. Jack put the car in gear, and we drove the four short blocks to my parents' house. I got out of the car and said, See you tomorrow evening. It was nice to visit my parents, but I couldn't wait for Saturday night. Things must have changed in the last four years. I knew I had changed. It would be fun to see old friends and renew friendships. At the party, I spoke with Kenny Carter, whose father owned a fencing company. He had taken over the family business, and we were discussing how the company was holding up during the economic downturn when I felt a tap on my shoulder and heard, Hey, neighbor, long time no see. Looking over my shoulder, I saw her, Lauren, and standing next to her was a girl I didn't know. She was as beautiful and desirable as always. Still, Billy Barber's grinning face and Lauren's back walking away from me were all I could think about. I turned my back to continue talking to Kenny, but the other girl tugged at my shoulder and grinned. That was rude, dude. Not as rough as what she did to me, I snapped back. Jeff, please, you can't still be mad at me for that night. It's been six years, Lauren said. I'm damn sure I can, I said angrily, turning and walking away. Behind me, I heard Becca exclaim loudly, See, that's why! Becca ran off to console Lauren and her friend while Jack pulled me out onto the outside deck. Jack told me that I would have to make things right for Becky. He asked me to apologize to Lauren. He begged me, otherwise he would not have privacy tonight. Friends don't let friends go unattended, so I accepted it and went looking for Lauren. 
I found these three in the kitchen. Could you two leave? I want to talk to Lauren alone. Lauren's friend spat, no way. Leave her alone, bastard. Becca chimed in saying, they're really old friends. Let them talk. Both girls left, leaving Lauren and I alone. We spent a few awkward moments in silence when I decided to take action. Lauren, I want to apologize for saying what I said. I know you didn't expect this. What happened that night was so long ago. I have to tell you that my feelings and ego were dealt a serious blow, and it came from a place I would never have suspected. I trusted you so much. Maybe it's time to leave it all behind. No, you're right, Jeff. I did something false. I was acting like a little shit, weren't I? I truly deserved what you said tonight. I never apologized for what I did. Would you accept an apology from me now? Thank you, Lauren, and yes, I accept your apology. Lauren jumped into my arms and hugged me. We looked into each other's eyes and then kissed. Becca and Jack walked into the kitchen and Becca remarked, Damn me, honey. Looks like you really knew what you were doing. Jack sighed in relief, then puffed out his chest, saying, Damn right, and don't forget it. We all laughed and joined the party. Lauren and I started dating and got married nine months later. The conductor called the next station, bringing me back to the present. As the train pulled out of the station, I mentally replayed the last three months of my marriage in my head. When I finally got off the train, I was sure of it. My wife cheated on me and our marriage. It seemed silly to make such a conclusion based on a country western song, but it all fit. I was sure of it, especially when the small voice that usually seemed so soothing to me when it told me to buy this currency or sell that currency was now ringing alarm bells that I could not ignore. When I passed Howard Goldman on the way to my office, he looked at me strangely. I sank heavily into my chair with Howard close behind me. What's wrong with you this morning? He asked. Nothing, was my monosyllabic answer. Bullshit, was Howard's response. I get paid a lot of money to ensure that all my people are happy and satisfied when they come to work. From the state you are in, I can say that today I will not allow you to play with the bank's money. So tell me what's wrong or go home. I sighed. Are you sure you want to get involved in this, Howard? He nodded affirmatively. I looked at him and shook my head. Then I blurted out, I think Lauren is having an affair. Howard's face showed shock. You are sure? Asked Howard. I replied, Honestly, no, it's not like that. It's just a feeling I get. Your feelings are usually correct, he admitted. So you shouldn't ignore them. What are you going to do? I'm not sure. I only found out today, I replied. Don't worry about anything. I will support you in whatever you decide. When you figure out what you want to do, let me know. My door is always open. I don't want you to spend too much bank money today. I don't think you're at the top of your game, Howard insisted. Of course, I knew he was right. I let my employees do most of the work that day and for the next two weeks after that. I think they liked the freedom to work without my involvement. Perhaps my presence was too noticeable for them to feel comfortable having me around. I got up, closed, and locked the door. As I sat down, tears welled up in my eyes and ran down my cheeks. What kind of person I was. I wasn't even sure if anything was happening, and I was already crying. I thought about life without Lauren. I loved this woman from the moment I first saw her. I didn't think I could move on if I lost her. I laid my head on the table and closed my eyes, immersed in my misery. I'm not sure how long I stayed in that position, but somewhere along the way the pain turned into something else. I no longer felt pain. I felt angry. I thought about going home and facing Lauren. That would be really stupid, wouldn't it? What evidence did I have? I had lyrics for a country song. No, I would need to get proof. I would need to formulate a plan. I would make her pay. I would also make the person she did this to pay. I wanted them to experience the same emotions that I did. They would feel pain. I would take care of it. I needed to make a plan, and quickly. The first thing I did when I left work was buy several voice-activated digital voice recorders and place them in discreet places around the house. I have placed them in the bedrooms, bathrooms, and garage. 
places where she could talk to someone without having to talk on the phony. Then I connected the recorder to the phonese. I decided that was all I needed to catch her. I'll just be vigilant, and sooner or later it will show itself. I tried to act normal around Lauren, but I guess I wasn't doing a very good job. I installed the recorders on Wednesday, and by Friday, I had the first evidence of Lauren's betrayal. The incriminating conversation on Friday went something like this. Jim, this is Lauren. Why are you calling me at home? What if my wife answered the phone? Jim Beckman barked. Don't worry, I would come up with an excuse for work. I think we should back off a little. Jeff is acting strange. Did he accuse you of anything? No, he is behaving abnormally. He seems cold and distant. Maybe we should just chill this for a while. Okay. If you think it's better this way... Jim got angry. And then an idea came to his mind. Lauren, you know that in two weeks I'm leaving for Miami. Why don't I try to convince Fred to send you with me? Then we could spend a week together. What do you think? He asked. I don't know. He might not have gone through with it even if he hadn't acted so funny. The way he acts might make him... Well, I don't know. I don't want to make him suspicious. I could ask him and see what he does. If he acts weird, I can decide if he knows anything. Let me check with Fred, and if he agrees, then you can tell Jeff that this is a work trip. Jim laughed happily. I will talk to you tomorrow. Bye. So now I know for sure. Before that, it was just lyrics to a song. Now it was for real. Lauren cheated on me. She plans to go away for a week so she can cuckold me with this asshole Beckwith. When the realization came, I was overcome with a heavy sadness. I felt sad for Lauren. I was sad about our marriage. Gradually, the sadness turned into pain. How could she do this to us? How could she do this to me? Once again, my pain turned to anger. If she cheated, I would get proof and get a divorce. I would need a plan, and I didn't have one yet. I came home from work at my usual time, 7.30 p.m. Trading was unusually lively. Tomorrow at the market opening, everyone will tell how well I do my job. There were millions of dollars on the line, and my mind wasn't where it needed to be. My wife was preparing dinner. How was your day? She asked, kissing me on the lips. She acted as if she was glad to see me. This hasn't happened very often over the past few months. I was waiting for Lauren to come to me about her business trip to Miami. On Monday and Tuesday, I expected it, but it did not come. I spent long hours outside working in the yard or working on our cars, anything but spend time with your wife. I was afraid that I would blurt out everything I knew about her cheating. I knew tonight would be the night. I hoped that I could pull off my own deception. It was a hard day. I'm glad to see that you're in a good mood, I replied. I'm happy, and I hope you will be happy too after I tell you my good news. My day wasn't that great. You speak first, I said. Okay, Lauren chuckled. I was asked to go to South Beach for a seminar on the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. It's an all-expenses-paid stay at the Victor Hotel, one of the old Art Deco hotels on Ocean Avenue in the heart of South Beach, she shouted again. The bad thing is that I won't be here from Friday this week to Saturday next. I'll be gone for nine days, honey. Do you mind if I go? She looked straight into my eyes. She cocked her head slightly to the side, trying to figure out if I had seen through her deception or if I was just angry that she would be gone for so long. When I looked into her eyes again, I saw that they were full of excitement, but somewhere in the depths, there was a hint of sadness. Nine days is a long time, honey. Do you have to leave? Is it something that will be used against you if you don't do it? I asked. I don't know, Jeff. Perhaps this is true. I know that Mr. Beckman counts on my help at this seminar. This will be a feather in my cap if I do go, she added. I walked to the front door and looked out onto the front lawn. I knew that if I said yes, our marriage would be over. If I had said no, it would have been over anyway. Over the previous four days, I had made a plan, and now I had made a decision. I whispered quietly, If it's important to you or your work, of course you can go. When are you leaving? I asked. Did I not hear you? 
Did you say I could go? She asked incredulously. I could not say these words because I knew that my voice would tremble. I simply nodded my head affirmatively. Lauren ran up to me and hugged me tightly, saying, Thank you. Thank you. This means so much to me. I promise you won't regret it. I've already done it. Lauren was scheduled to fly out of Kennedy Airport at 10.30 in the morning on Friday. I told Lauren, I'll take the day off from work to take you to the airport. Lauren looked surprised and suggested, You don't have to take the day off, honey. Mr. Beckman volunteered to drive me. Never. You are leaving me for nine days and I want to be there to see you off. What could she say? I'm sure she'd rather go with Mr. Asshole Beckman, but I wonder what that would look like for her unwilling husband. Her momentary disappointment quickly gave way to a smile as she happily sang, That's great, honey. I wish you could take me with you. What a great liar she was. I knew that I had upset the lover's plan just a little, and I felt a little satisfaction. She let her guard down just for a second, allowing her frustration to show. If I hadn't been so knowledgeable, I'm sure I would have missed it. Thursday morning found me plopped down in a large chair in Howard's office with the words, It's this weekend. Lauren is going on a business trip to Miami. South Beach, no less. They leave on Friday morning and return the following Saturday. There was a fire in Howard's eyes as he told me, Whatever you want to do, you're safe. Yesterday I spoke with Mr. Diamond about your situation and he gave you carte blanche on the company credit card. You will have to reimburse the bank for all non-business expenses within two weeks of your return. When I asked Howard how I could repay Mr. Diamond, he laughed. A good single malt scotch whiskey will be enough to pay. You probably don't know this, but he really screwed up his divorce last year. He hates cheating wives. I shook my head in disgust. I knew he was divorced and I didn't know why. But now I know. Howard. I need the next two weeks of vacation. I need proof of her infidelity. Spend as much time as you need, within reason, of course. I'll keep an eye on your team and make sure they don't screw up too much. Somehow I hope this is all a mistake. Lauren is a wonderful girl. I still can't believe it, Howard admitted. I have a hard time believing this too, I thought. I took the rest of the day off to do some shopping. Before leaving, I went online and purchased a round-trip ticket to Miami International Airport on JetBlue Airways. I stopped by City Camera and purchased a top-of-the-line Canon digital camera. It will take crystal-clear photos and videos with sound. It came with a detachable optical zoom lens. The seller said that I could see an eagle's butt from a hundred meters away. Then I bought a small carry-on bag. Then a trip to Walmart for new clothes, shorts, tops, underwear, sneakers, and sandals. The last item was a New York Yankees cap. As a die-hard Mets fan, Lauren would never have believed that I would wear a Yankees cap. All the lids had patriotic messages, flags, and eagles. I didn't usually wear a shirt like this. The last stop was the drugstore, where I bought some new razors and a box of black hair dye. Now I was ready for my journey. I packed the new luggage into the trunk of my car. All purchases were made using a company card. If Lauren looked at our bank accounts, she wouldn't know anything. I was ready. Let the games begin. That evening at home, I asked Lauren about her travel itinerary. She was on the 10.30 morning flight from JFK on JetBlue Airlines and was staying in room 314 at the Victor Hotel. Mr. Beckman, as I was told, was staying in another room. Of course it was him. I was scheduled to take a 1.30 flight to Miami, three hours after her. I also managed to get a room at the Victor Hotel. I would be in room 541. I hoped I wouldn't get caught checking in. We got up early on Friday morning because we wanted to get to the airport by 8.30, so Lauren wouldn't have any problems getting through security. On the way to Kennedy Airport, the conversation was quiet. She tried to start a conversation, but I wasn't very talkative. The realization that I was driving my wife to the airport to encourage an affair left a deep impression on me. Her actions broke my heart, and I was very hurt, having a hard time hiding my emotions. Jeff, are you upset? Do you mind if I go on this trip? You said it's okay if I go. I know what I said, Lauren, but the reality of you being gone for nine days just blows my mind. I know you have to leave. 
I don't want to be away from you for so long. I will miss you so much. It already hurts me to realize that you are leaving. I know you can understand that, I replied. Lauren replied, Of course, I understand that. I feel the same way. It will be a long and lonely nine days away from you. Maybe so, but I'll be hanging around our house alone while you're relaxing in a glamorous hotel in South Beach with the stars, I moaned. Lauren laughed. Is that what's bothering you? This trip will be mostly work and not too much leisure, that's for sure. I looked at her and smiled sadly. I knew she was lying. After that, we chatted a bit and soon pulled into a short-term parking lot. We headed to the JetBlue check-in counter, dropped off her luggage, and picked up Lauren's boarding pass. We approached the roped-off security area and saw Beckman waiting for Lauren. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Lauren glance quickly to see my reaction to him. Beckman had the nerve to walk up to us, give Lauren a quick kiss on the cheek, and then offer me his hand. All I wanted to do was beat this guy up, but I worked hard to appear unsuspecting and friendly. I actually smiled when we shook hands. I knew I was probably going to get my ass kicked since he was 6 f one in and a lot heavier than me. I would have at least dealt the first crushing blow. Maybe that would be enough. However, a fight was not part of the plan. Jim spoke up. Lauren, we need to start a security check right now. Good to see you again, Jeff. I'll take good care of Lauren while she's gone. I stood there and looked at him long and intently. Lauren's face turned pale. She quickly came to her senses. Jeff, Jim means that nothing bad will happen to me while I'm gone. I turned to Lauren and said darkly, I know what he means, Lauren. I smiled at Beckman and said, Thank you for looking after her. Thinking I had been fooled, their faces brightened and they turned to walk through the security gate. Beckman was the first through the gate and began to descend along the roped-off area. Lauren was about to hand her paperwork to the large black female TSA agent when I grabbed her arm and pulled her back towards me. Are you leaving and haven't said goodbye to your husband? I asked. Lauren looked at me embarrassedly and hugging and kissing me replied, Of course, how imprudent of me. I held her tightly to me and said, I need to talk to you before you leave. We have never been apart for so long before. I want you to know that I have loved you since I was 16 years old. Lauren smiled at me and was about to speak when I started again. You are leaving on a plane, and I will go home alone. Anything can happen to us. If for some reason you never see me again, I want you to know that you are the best thing that ever happened to me, and I love you more every day. If anything ever happens to you, I won't be able to live anymore. I kissed and hugged her, saying, I love you. Have a safe trip and return to my home safe and sound, Lauren said. I love you too, honey. But now I have to go. When she started to walk away from me, I grabbed her hand and pulled her back towards me. I had to try again to ask her not to leave. There was a look of surprise on her face as I turned her around to face me. Lauren, I know I told you it was okay, that you could leave. I meant it when I said it. Now that you're leaving, I realize that I don't want you to leave. It's not too late. Tell him you can't and come home with me. Blame it all on me. What do you think? Jeff, you know I can't give up on Mr. Beckman at this late date. Tickets purchased and paid for. Besides, he needs me at this seminar. I know I'm being selfish, but I don't want you to leave. I need you too. Jeff, I need to go. Don't try to stop me. My decision is made. I'm going on this journey. I will be a great help to Jim. I can't let him down. She looked me in the eyes again and almost spoke, but then changed her mind. She turned, walked to the gate, and gave the agent her documents. My eyes became misty as I knew she was lying. I'm sure Lauren thought it was because she was moving away and I would miss her. I walked across the roped-off area to where Beckman was waiting. I watched Lauren as she spoke with the TSA agent for a few moments. As she walked towards us, I saw that she was excited. I wondered what they were talking about that made her so upset. By the time she got to where we were standing, she had regained her composure. They went to the machines to take an x-ray of their belongings. 
I watched as Lauren took off her shoes and placed them in a plastic basket. She turned to me and shrugged in a what-you-can-do gesture. She then turned to walk through the body scanner. By then, I had reached the limit of my endurance and quickly left the building. I wasn't angry anymore. I was just resigned to the fact that Lauren wasn't mine anymore. I was starting to get used to the fact that we would soon be separated. I moved my car from short-term to long-term parking, collected my carry-on luggage, and returned to the terminal. I waited until the departure board showed that Lauren's plane had departed and went through security myself. I sat down to have breakfast and waited for my flight. I arrived at the hotel by taxi and checked in without any problems. The hair salon on site was open. I asked him to shave my face and give me a very short crew cut. Once in my room, I dyed my hair black. When I finished, I looked in the mirror and thought that even my mother wouldn't recognize me. Wearing sunglasses and a baseball cap, I could walk around the hotel without worrying that neither Beckman nor Lauren would know it was me. The hotel itself was interesting. It was built in the shape of a U. The middle of the U faced Ocean Avenue. Beyond Ocean Avenue is Lummis Park and then the Atlantic Ocean. Lauren and Jim's room was in the right wing of the U on the third floor. My room was in the U Center, room 541, with a great view of the ocean. In addition to the reception area, there were shops and boutiques on the ground floor. There was an outdoor swimming pool in the center of the building on the second floor. It ran the length of the arms in a U shape with lounge chairs arranged around the pool. Towels and drinks were available. From the balcony of my room, I had a view of the entire pool. Across the road is the entrance to the park embankment. The ocean view was magnificent. Under other circumstances, this would have been a romantic setting. This time, it wasn't romantic at all. Around 8 o'clock, I made the obligatory phone call to Lauren. She picked up the phone and said, Hello, honey. I'm glad you called. I called your home several times, but you didn't answer the calls. I was worried about you. Where have you been? She asked. I went to one of the local bars with the guys from work. They were raving about some club and persuaded me to go. That's all, I replied. She had the nerve to say, you better not hit on any girls there, Jeff. Remember that you are a married man. I don't think I could forgive you if you did that. This woman has balls, I thought. She's here to continue her affair with Beckman and then warns me not to start my own. Why do you think that I would cheat on you? Have I ever given you any reason to suspect me of betraying you or our marriage? You know me better than anyone. I could never hurt you by doing something as dirty as this. Now I pressed harder. I know you would never do something like that to me. That's why I let you go on this trip to Florida. I trust you completely. I trust you with my heart, even my life. You know it. You understand, don't you? I asked. Of course, honey, I feel the same way too. I don't know why I said this. I know you won't do anything like that to me, she stammered. Look, Jeff, I'm really tired from the plane ride, and I think it's making me bitchy. You call tomorrow and I'll be in a better mood, okay? Of course, Lauren, we can talk tomorrow, I replied. Good night, Jeff. I love you, Lauren added. Suddenly tired of the verbal sparring, I simply said, Good night, Lauren, and hung up. Did she notice that I didn't say I loved her too? Would she even care, I thought? I spent a restless night in bed. Sleep did not come easily. My mind could only imagine what was happening in room 314. I woke up on Saturday morning with neither light nor dawn. Woke is the wrong word because I was already awake and watching the sun rise over the Atlantic Ocean. My plan was to track the traders throughout the hotel, since it turned out that my room was all I needed. After breakfasting on scrambled eggs and pancakes in my room, I spent some time on the balcony. I was sitting in a chair enjoying the sun, when out of the corner of my eye I saw Lauren walking towards the pool with this idiot. As I crept into my room, an idea occurred to me. There are two large artificial plants in flower pots in the room. If I stood on the balcony, I could watch the pool without being noticed. Trying not to make any noise, I moved both plants to the balcony and placed a chair behind them. I then went inside to get my camera and tripod and set them up so that the camera lens protruded through the fake foliage. I was sure that no one would notice the lens. By this time, Lauren and Beckman were already sitting on lounge chairs and talking. Lauren sat facing the U-shaped armrest that was their room. 
Lauren was closest to me, and Beckman was on the other side. I realized that Lauren had done some shopping for this trip. She wore a red bikini with a revealing top that showed off her cleavage. The bottom was cut so high that I was sure half of her butt would be on display when she stood up. I turned on the camera and zoomed in on the cheating couple. I soon realized there was a flaw in my plan. I couldn't hear what they were saying. I needed to know what they were talking about. I have an idea and will work on it later. I waited half an hour before I discovered the first signs of infidelity. Beckman, God bless his lustful heart, kissed her on the lips. Over the next hour, I saw three more kisses before they got up to leave. I saw that I was right. Even worse, they left holding hands. Anyone could see that they were a couple. When they left, I turned off the camera. Returning to my room, I fell on the bed. A single tear rolled down from my eye. Sadness came over me and I was very tired. Seeing Lauren cheating was much worse than suspecting it. This feeling quickly passed. I took out my laptop and googled spy stores in the South Beach area. Luckily, there was one on Collins Avenue, a short walk from the hotel. Donning a ghillie suit and walking quickly, I was soon back in my hotel room with what I needed. Another tripod and a top-of-the-line parabolic microphone. It had the ability to connect to my camera, allowing me to add audio to the video I was filming. The microphone was mounted on a new tripod next to the camera. Next time, I'll be able to hear what they're saying. I woke up Sunday morning with a start. It was light and sunny outside. I was exhausted having gotten very little sleep on Friday night. After dinner on Saturday night, I fell asleep and slept through the night. Looking at the clock, I realized that it was 10 a.m. Lauren and Beckman could have already left the hotel and the day could have been wasted. I went to the bathroom and performed my morning ablutions. After getting dressed, I walked out onto the balcony and saw Lauren and Beckman coming out of Lummis Park. I turned on the camera and microphone and then called Lauren on the phone. I listened to what the camera recorded. I heard Lauren's phone ringing. The parabolic microphone worked as I had hoped. I saw Lauren look at the phone when Beckman asked, Who is this? This idiot. Lauren answered with a laugh. Beckman laughed too. Suddenly alarmed, Lauren said, I have to answer the phone. Something bad could have happened. Why else would he call on Sunday morning? She accepted the challenge. Jeff, is everything okay? Something happened? She asked. I had the urge to say, there will be no bullshit. But I restrained my anger. Instead, I replied, it's okay, honey. I was lonely, and I just wanted to hear your voice. It's good to know that you care about me. I worry about you all the time, Jeff. It's Sunday morning, and I thought something bad might have happened. You scared the crap out of me, Lauren snapped, annoyed. I was fed up with Lauren's attitude and told her, I didn't know I'd be like this. Bother you, Lauren. I felt alone. I thought talking to my wife would lift my spirits. Sorry to bother you. She started to answer, but I hung up before she could finish the thought. Don't worry, she said into the silent phone. I heard her talking on a switched-off phone through a parabolic microphone. She turned off the phone and walked to the nearest bench. What did he want? asked Beckman. He was lonely and wanted to talk to me. Why did I attack him like that? Lauren asked this question more to herself than to Beckman. Beckman expressed his opinion anyway. Lauren, we've been having this affair for six months now. Maybe you're starting to get tired of him. Maybe Man it's time to let him go, you know, get a we divorce. Then we could spend more time together. We well, won't have to hide Lauren anymore, he suggested. Okay, she snapped. Morning. Your wife won't mind if we go to your house for a matinee, will she? Care of things at home. Yes, Continued she said mockingly. We won't have to hide anymore. On the bell, so Lauren grinned. Final Jim, the you earn $38,000 a year. You have no prospects below. of achieving more. Since Jeff's last promotion, with his year-end bonus... He makes almost 200000 a year. I like you, Jim, but you're not that good. Jeff is pretty good at this, so I really won't be missing out on too much. But someday he will become the CEO of this bank, and I intend to be there to share it with him. So there will be no divorce. Get that idea out of your head. Besides, you will never divorce Jane. You will never leave your two children either. So stop pestering me about the divorce. 
You're right, Beckman replied almost shyly. But that doesn't mean we can't enjoy each other's company while we're here, right? That's right, my wife smiled. Taking his hand, she dragged him across the street and out of sight. I thought, six fucking months, I cheated for six fucking months. She only stayed with me for the money I could make. I couldn't get those callous remarks out of my head. This shouldn't have happened. Not if I could help it. I wondered if I'd had enough of this. Enough to get a divorce on my terms. I thought I needed more. I was determined to get it. Lauren and Beckman were more than willing to help me obtain the evidence I needed. They didn't know it at the time. At two o'clock, I noticed Lauren walking towards the pool again, wearing a tangerine cape. Beckman was standing right behind her. I quickly turned on the camera and microphone and rotated the camera until they were in the viewfinder. Beckman sat down while Lauren remained standing with her back to him. She turned and took off the covers. I was shocked, and I'm sure Beckman was shocked too. Lauren wasn't wearing a top. Beckman stared at her, and Lauren laughed and asked, Do you like it? I like it. Beckman answered. She was wearing, or almost wearing, the thinnest tangerine-colored bikini panties. Lauren asked her to apply cream. She handed Beckman a bottle of lotion. He took the bottle and began to apply. He replied, I can't. Look what you did to me. At that moment, one of the hotel employees approached them and said, Miss, some guests complained that you were showing nudity by the pool. Such demonstrations are prohibited on hotel premises. I have to insist that you cover yourself. They retreated to the safety of their room. I checked the camera to make sure it recorded what was happening. And so it was. I felt like I had almost had enough. If only I could get them to work, this would be over. I didn't call Lauren on the phone that Sunday night. I called earlier. I felt as if I had been rebuffed. On the other hand, Lauren didn't call me either. On Monday morning, I woke up at 9 a.m. I ordered breakfast as usual. I decided to watch from my vantage point on the balcony and see what I could capture with my new camera. It wasn't until 6 p.m. that I saw something interesting. The doors to their room slid open and Beckman stepped out onto the balcony. He was wearing one of the free thick cotton robes provided by the hotel. The robe was tied in the front and he stood with both hands on the railing looking out over the pool. I aimed my video and audio equipment at the balcony and started recording when Lauren came out wearing the same robe. I managed to film evidence of their infidelity. This was the kind of incriminating evidence I would need to prove adultery. It wouldn't matter in court, but it might matter to Lauren's mom and dad, and perhaps to friends and other relatives as well. This entire video was filmed in public and would be admissible in any court. After watching the scene on the hotel balcony, I realized that my marriage was over. The balcony video was now definitive proof that she had been unfaithful. Maybe I should give more evidence. She actually admitted as much during a Sunday morning phone call. It was hard to hear about it, but it was unbearable to see it. I decided I'd had enough. I will be leaving tomorrow. I used my phone to confirm my flight was leaving tomorrow at 3. Luckily, there were a few empty seats. It's been half an hour since I saw Lauren cheat. I wondered if they had already done this. I wondered if they might still be doing this. I decided that now might be a good time to call my loving wife every evening. I hoped it would distract me at the right time. I dialed Lauren's number on her cell phone and she picked up on the fifth ring. What a surprise. She seemed out of breath. Hello, she muttered. Lauren. I asked it with concern in my voice. Are you okay? It took you a long time to pick up the phone and you seemed out of breath. I had to give her credit. Lauren was a clever liar when she answered, I was in the shower when I heard the phone ring. I grabbed a towel and ran to answer the call. You should have seen me sitting naked on the bed. I think you'd have some naughty ideas. I'm sure I would, baby. I'm calling to see how your day was. Did you have a productive time at the seminar? Oh, she said stammeringly. Yes, Jeff, we had a good day at the seminar. I heard something in her answer. It was in her voice. This took me by surprise. She continued, How was your day, honey? I feel depressed and I feel a little sorry for myself. I miss your sweet voice. I miss hugging you and being kissed back. 
What I miss most is you lying next to me in bed at night. This bed gets big and lonely when you're not here to share it with me. But I don't have to tell you that. You feel the same way. You know what it's like to wake up alone in the morning. You spend your nights alone, don't you, Lauren? Well, I finally threw it out of there. I wondered what she would say. All I heard was some muffled conversation. Lauren, are you here? I asked. You sleep alone, right? Then she came back. That's right, honey, that's true, she lied. Listen, Jeff, I'm freezing here and I'm all wet, and now I need to go. I will talk to you tomorrow, fine? I didn't answer. I love you, she said. I answered, that's right. Goodbye, Lauren. I hung up. I packed my tripods and microphone. Then I packed what little clothes I had with me. It's been a long time since I last ate. I changed my clothes and went down to the hotel restaurant to have something to eat. I took my camera with me to view today's footage. As the hostess led me to a table, I saw Lauren and Beckman sitting in a booth. I walked right past them and sat down two tables away from them and a little behind. I stood behind Lauren, facing Beckman. I managed to take a couple of pictures without them noticing. When the waitress brought my food, I noticed Lauren glance in my direction, but she didn't show any concern. She clearly didn't recognize me. I must have looked like any other tourist looking through daytime photos on my camera. I calmly finished my dinner, sneaking glances at the two lovebirds. I noticed Lauren glance in my direction again, but there was no recognition on her face. I finished eating and left first, and they were still sitting in the booth, and it was difficult to fall asleep again. The next day at seven in the morning, I got up and sat on the balcony. I moved the plants back into the room. I no longer cared if they saw me. I had the proof I needed. Not that I actually wanted to find anything. I didn't want to find any evidence. I was saddened because I had evidence that Lauren was cheating. I was admiring the sunrise when I saw a white van with blue Phoebe lettering on the side pull up at 7.15. Lauren and Beckman got into the van and it drove off. Damn me, I thought they actually did some work this week. This morning I had two things to do. First, I gained access to one of two computers provided by the hotel for guests. I printed two photographs that I have taken since I arrived here. I then walked up to the front desk and asked who would be working the counter on Saturday morning. I learned that it was a young man named Carlos. We chatted and I slipped him $200. If all went well, Lauren and Beckman would be in for a little surprise when they left on Saturday morning. I checked out and flew back to New York to take care of things at home. Continued in the next video. Subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so you don't miss the second final part. The link to the second part will be in the description of this video below. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.